Thank you very much, Bippen, uh, for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be in Krakow. It's my first time to Poland, and uh, I'm uh, enjoying it. I just wish I had more time uh, to spend here this particular trip. Uh, uh, and you do have, please forgive me for having to leave, but I have another uh, commitment I have to honor uh, as well, too, after lunch, uh, or before lunch. But, so I'll be here through the next panel and the like as well, too, in coffee break if there's any questions. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is something I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, apologies for those of you who may have seen a version of this talk uh, earlier. Uh, it's not uh, too different from that, and that's largely because my position and, and thoughts have not changed dramatically on that. Uh, I will try and uh, uh, present not only my viewpoint, but a broader viewpoint. And as I typically am, and with respect to uh, these kinds of questions, ethical questions in general, I tend to not be prescriptive. In other words, I try and not tell you what the right answer is. I just try and paint different futures uh, and uh, hopefully maybe some are more seductive than others, I don't know, but uh, uh, please uh, uh, try and factor that into your thinking as well. So uh, uh, I'll be talking about what the United Nations refers to uh, these systems as lethal autonomous weapon systems or laws. Uh, there have been debates going on there for the last three years, there's another meeting, I don't know if it's going on right now, it's in November, where they're probably going to be standing up governmental experts to continue to examine what should be done uh, about the advent of lethal autonomous weapon systems. And there's a real question of what are they? We still haven't adequately defined them in terms of uh, their, what is autonomy in this context and what is meaningful human control. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But uh, I'm not advocating war. No way, okay? I, advocate pacifists to try and find ways to avoid wars. But there are a couple of assumptions underlying my work. Uh, and one of the first is that, unfortunately, warfare will continue. Uh, it has since all recorded history. Uh, and for those who are, uh, have pacifistic tendencies, I would encourage you to continue those and try and find a way that these systems will never, ever have to be used. But what I'm referring to today is when we find ourselves in conflict. Can this kind of technology play an appropriate role, an ethical role, in the conduct uh, of warfare? There's reasons the militaries are interested in this and have been for decades. Um, there's uh, the ability to have fewer war fighters uh, conducting uh, these operations. Uh, fewer soldiers I mean lower standing armies and cheaper uh, 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 situations. Also, an individual war fighter can now do the tasks of many, uh, conceivably. You can potentially fight over larger areas than you did previously. Uh, if you look at the Predator and Reaper and soon to be Avenger, uh, we have people flying those in Nevada, at Creech and Nellis Air Force bases, uh, and flying them over Afghanistan and God knows where else. Uh, take your pick, Yemen, uh, who knows uh, where they happen to be today. Uh, doing these kinds of things. And they can also stay on station for a lot longer. For the individual warfighter, uh, they enable on the ground, for example, a, a warfighter to see further into the battle space than they would otherwise, uh, to be able to project force or act uh, further into the battle space uh, as well. Uh, one obvious side effect of all of this is a reduction in friendly casualties. It gives better protection for your own warfighters. Uh, but at what cost is a separate question uh, as well, too. But this is the major reasons the military are looking at this. But uh, when I started talking about this about 12 years ago, uh, there was no place for artificial intelligence in the consideration of ethical performance of these systems. And a lot has happened uh, in the discussions uh, since that time. And uh, uh, it's really encouraging to hear so many voices, and if you're not a voice in this discussion, please be one after uh, today or after the entire workshop uh, to express your thoughts and opinions. And I don't necessarily say they should be mine, uh, but they should be yours uh, and come to grips with what the world is trying to wrestle with in the context of this new advent of technology. People have been developing this technology for quite some time. Uh, a colleague of mine from Spay War in San Diego, a, a US military base, just completed a book of unmanned systems in World War I and World War II, and it's this thick. Uh, it's a great read if you're interested in the history of these systems. So the real question is, what are autonomous systems? Some people argue in the battlefield they don't exist yet, because yeah, the Terminator doesn't exist yet, and I hope and pray it never does exist. Um, but uh, there are uh, systems that are out there, which by a roboticist definition of autonomy, uh, where it can sense, act, uh, and 
make decisions, pre-programmed decisions, based on human programming, uh, those systems have been around and some have been mothballed for quite some time. Examples include the South Korean system, which is currently deployed along the demilitarized zone. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, Russia has just deployed one uh, which has autonomous capabilities to protect uh, a border protection of their nuclear facilities. Uh, the U.S. for a long time has had fire and forget systems, even cruise missiles for example, do roboticists qualify uh, as an autonomous system because you launch it, it follows a path, and it engages a target without any additional human intervention. Does it have meaningful human control? Well, that's the question how you define meaningful human control uh, on these sorts of things. Israel uh, has had the Harpy system, which is a fire and forget loitering missile, which uh, waits for a radar signature to be turned on and then could potentially engage that target without additional human invention, uh, intervention. The uh, uh, Aegis class cruisers have the phalanx system, uh, which is a system that the captain turns on, uh, or the commander turns on, to uh, uh, shoot down any incoming missiles. Keep in mind that these missiles are coming in at supersonic speeds uh, and sea skimming very low, and so you don't have a whole lot of time to think about what you're going to do, other than think about, am I going to turn it on or am I going to turn it off uh, at this particular point? Okay. There are some cases where you can intervene. There are other cases that you can't. One could even argue at a ballistic level, a, uh, an artillery shell uh, is that. But I'd like to cover, if I can, what I'd like to cover and then open it up for questions afterwards, if that's okay. So, uh, um, there, but there are many, many other examples as well, too, and the list goes on and on. And if you're interested, if Poland wants to buy one, uh, there you go. Uh, Dodam Systems in Korea uh, sells systems that you can't see here, but has autonomous detection and manual autonomous firing with safety. You can pick your, these are lethal combat robots. You can pick your weapon system. You can pick your sensor system. And uh, have it patrolling the streets of your uh, new presidential government, who I understand your president's an alumni. Uh, I understand of this esteemed university as well, too. And uh, Poland also has a more interesting perspective relative to the US, new US perspective as well, too, which. Uh, from my side, I commiserate uh, with you, but others may have different points of view uh, for that uh, as well. But you can get them. The United States has these so-called force-bearing unmanned systems. This is actually an old chart uh, which talks about the ability to project force, which often means kinetic weaponry, which means bullets and shells and things of that sort, or torpedoes. Uh, many of these were research in their day. Some have come to fruition. These are only the unclassified systems. There are classified systems, of course, as well, too. I do not have a security clearance, nor do I want one, because I want to be able to talk to you about everything I know. And if I did have one of those, I wouldn't be able to do that, and I'd have to report back that I've spoken to each and every one of you as well, too, uh, at this point. Uh, so I'm glad not to have that. But let's talk about what's a real, real problem in this day and age is what happens in the battlefield to non-combatants. You see it every day uh, in the news, the complete slaughter uh, of innocents in the battle space. It's happening right now in uh, Iraq and Syria uh, routinely. Uh, and the real question is, what can technology do? Can technology potentially help protect non-combatants than they currently are? And one aspect of that is maybe lethal autonomous weapons can potentially help, and I'll try and uh, tell you a little bit about that. But we must, at some level, do something. It's not just about winning wars. It's not just about protecting your borders. It's also about doing it consistent with international humanitarian law, uh, as developed by the International Committee of the Red Cross and others who uh, guard that. And I'm going to give you a hard time by walking around a lot. I tend to do that. Uh, but I do believe that we can potentially save lives for this. And part of it is, we, if we do that, you need to locate this technology where the killing occurs. That sounds inhumane, uh, but that's warfare. Remember, I was saying that wars uh, are fighting. And the question is, can we do better uh, with protecting non-combatants under these circumstances? Um, there are many folks that have been listening for this for quite some time. Uh, Human Rights Watch and the International uh, what is it, the uh, ICRAC, the International Committee of Robot Arms Control, was first founded around 2010 or something. I was at their initial meeting in Berlin as an expert, uh, talking about how we can eventually call for an outright ban on these particular systems and prevent them from coming into being uh, in the first place. Or if they exist, ban them. I still want to know exactly what it is that we're banning before I could potentially support a ban. 
The Department of Defense in 2012 came up with a directive 3000.09, which says that a certain class of these systems will not be developed uh, within the next 10 years, and we'll revisit that in five years, except under somewhat what appeared to me at the time extraordinary circumstances. I have learned since that they might not be quite as extraordinary uh, as I initially had thought, um, requiring high level approval of the Under Secretary of Defense and other things as well too to be able to develop and potentially deploy uh, lethal autonomous uh, weapon systems. And the UN uh, initially called for a moratorium and now they are discussing in Geneva uh, a ban. They've had three expert meetings. I had the honor of speaking at the uh, first one, uh, and uh, the discussion goes on and on, uh, often fueled by uh, the many NGOs that are engaged, Article 36 and others as well, too, in this debate. I encourage you to read these reports if you're interested in or if are worried about the proliferation or use of this technology uh, in the battle space. They'll give you a, a different perspective. You'll hear me coming from, for those of you who are ethicists, a largely utilitarian uh, argument. Uh, many of the NGOs take a more deontological argument in terms of uh, why we should not do this. And I will state, and I'll state it again later, I'm not averse to a ban. We need to do something. I'm more in favor of a moratorium at this point in time and potential regulation of these systems in circumstances where they cannot be shown to potentially protect uh, innocent civilian life better than uh, current war fighters do. A while back, you could see that the U.S. military and their roadmaps, which projected out 35 years, they continue to project way out. And the only reason, no one knows what a plan is going to be 35 years from now. That's almost ludicrous uh, to try and do that. But it does state something about the commitment that the Department of Defense of the United States is making to autonomous systems in the long haul. It is a major pillar of the U.S. military's uh, defense uh, portfolio at this point in time. And they said, uh, back then, it said the decision to fire will not likely be fully automated until legal rules of engagement and safety concerns have all been thoroughly examined and resolved. They are very concerned uh, about this, and rightly so. And a Air Force, which was not to be outdone, uh, went for a 48-year uh, plan, uh, flight plan in this particular case, because you can't have a roadmap for the Air Force. It has to be a flight plan. Um, uh, so they said uh, authorizing a machine to make lethal combat decisions is contingent upon political and military leaders resolving legal and ethical questions, and they must take place in the near term, which they are, which is a credit to those engaged in those discussions. I'm really happy that those discussions are going on, and instead of allowing them to uh, take its own path apart from this critical guidance. The most recent one, which just came out in July 2016, uh, talked about new and powerful robotic systems will be used to perform complex actions, make autonomous systems, and deliver lethal force, among other things as well, too. But what's of note is that our country is now worried about our adversaries using this technology. And that can also serve as a driver for us developing it as well, too. It says, uh, if coupled with the autonomous lethal decision-making capabilities that adversaries are more likely to employ. So, we're not the only people doing this, obviously. There's many nations that are uh, using robotic systems. Uh, uh, Jane's, I think it was up to 80 or so, um, and uh, not so many in development, but many have purchased those. Uh, Poland may probably have some in their armament. I was just at, in Prague, uh, uh, last month, a big NATO workshop with all kinds of robots and other things that were going on there as well, too. And they do extensive work with uh, autonomous systems as well. So all kinds of people are doing this. And also, non-state actors, Hezbollah, Hamas. I just saw that ISIS uh, was, they found a drone factory, uh, that they were looking at ISIS as well, too, using off-the-shelf drones uh, for the potential delivery of these systems. I don't know if they deployed them, but they, were, they found them when they were in, uh, moving into Mosul. So my own particular position, which uh, may or may not have an influence on yours, as I said, I'm not averse to a ban. I believe more in a, mor a moratorium. But most important, I do believe we have to do something about the slaughter of non-combatants in the battle space. And the bar is so low in terms of making improvement. If you look at the sheer numbers of uh, civilians that are slaughtered, I saw an article, I tweeted it not too long ago, out of 1,500 people that were killed in the last year in Iraq, I uh, think that was the number, over 1,000 were civilians. Uh, and that just, to me, is utterly unacceptable. And if you want to ban the use of this technology, okay, but tell me what you're going to do to help protect civilian life. I need to understand that uh, as well, too. 
And uh, of course, let's not do it based on uh, the Terminator movie, please, or other things of that sort as well. That's not uh, necessarily the wisest approach. There are many other factors as well, too. The real question is how can we prevent these either accidents, deliberate crimes, or, or carelessness uh, from uh, occurring. And there's reasons for the uh, governments to want to do this as well, too, because you can get war crime charges if you uh, uh, do not pay close attention to this. Uh, you may lose the ability to support your troops, calling for you to bring your folks back home with an incompleted mission, the morale themselves, uh, and hostility among the local population. All these are reasons why uh, a lethal force and its effect on civilians has to be uh, uh, carefully and closely monitored. And I mentioned there were two assumptions. And this is my other assumption. I said warfare will continue, and the second one is that lethal autonomy is inevitable. This is debated by many uh, of my colleagues uh, around the world. And it gets <laughs> to the question of what is lethal autonomy. Uh, and my take on it is a roboticist definition, which is basically be able to sense, understand the environment, and and essentially pull the trigger without additional uh, human intervention. You could do, have human intervention, but you don't necessarily have to have human intervention. You know, a human can say, don't shoot, or something like that in that case. But the decision making is being pushed more and more towards the so-called tip of the spear, where the decision is being made. As I mentioned, there are many cases. This notion about this loop business, whether the human is in the loop, or the leader is on the loop, or it's, uh, there's humans outside the loop. I don't even know what outside the loop means. I mean, what does it mean to have a robot with no human control at all? I mean, that's, that is a Terminator, right? That's basically something that evolved and created and went off and said, I'm going to kill what I want. I don't care what you think. Uh, why would any military possibly want that? You don't allow your soldiers to do that. Uh, why would you uh, want a robot to do that kind of system? So there's always, at some level, meaningful human control, but the debate is, does that mean before every single trigger pull? Or does it mean before it goes in and is allowed to do certain actions uh, or something uh, else? And uh, uh, the, uh, the way in which that could be backed off is if an international treaty or prohibition uh, is enacted, which may be possible. There is an example of proactive systems in the uh, 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 ICRC and international humanitarian law, which was the banning of blinding lasers. Uh, that has a very interesting history uh, uh, as well. I had the opportunity to actually speak to some of the physicians uh, that were in charge of understanding and coming up with a violation of superfluous injury. Uh, there's other things I could talk about in that, but I'm not going to deal with that today. But the notion of banning it on that basis, uh, of proactively banning a system before it exists, has happened at least once. Uh, the ICRC had a phrase which they characterized themselves internally as always being one war behind. Uh, we don't want them to be one war uh, behind. We want them to be a, one war ahead if they can possibly be in protecting civilians. And so there may be things to do with that. So rhetorically, I'm not asking you to answer these questions, uh, but these are the questions I ask at a rhetorical level. Uh, should soldiers be robots? What do we really do uh, in terms of programming people how to kill? Uh, we dehumanize them, uh, we teach them to obey orders, not completely blindly, but uh, more unquestioningly than we might do uh, otherwise. Uh, we put them through uh, rigorous training to be able to accomplish this. Um, and then the other question is, should robots be soldiers? Could we do better? When I go to Mexico, I'm talking about, I'm debating the issue of the singularity with Nick Bostrom, and uh, among others, and we're talking about, will, ro will <laughs> Will machines be so smart that they will completely lead to an existen uh, existential risk to the entire species of humanity? Well, if some people believe that. Is it so hard to believe that they will be capable of being more moral uh, or more humane than we are to each other? Especially in the battlefield, I would contend, where the bar is relatively low, where we do not treat each other well and historically. And we have uh, demonstrated that time and time again. So, the goal is basically how can we avoid these kinds of uh, horrors uh, which occur on a daily basis. Uh, we're just hearing a little bit more about it. And keep in mind, again, this goes back to all kinds of wars and every nation all the time. It is a normal effect, a tolerated effect, it seems, although becoming criminal, uh, of a warfare that uh, civilians can be uh, uh, slaughtered. Um, and you can go on and on. Every warfare that you had will have uh, examples uh, of this. 
The uh, United States uh, did a study of soldiers returning from Kuwait, to their credit. The, the first one uh, that was public, it evaluated the uh, uh, mental well-being of their soldiers uh, and the uh, moral uh, or the ethical behavior uh, that they had. Uh, this provides a benchmark for human level performance uh, in the battlefield. It did not ask them if they committed a war crime. Uh, they would not confess to that. In other words, did you kill a civilian? Uh, that would not have been an appropriate question, but they got information such as this. 45% of soldiers and 60% of Marines did not agree they would report a fellow soldier if he had injured or killed an innocent non-combatant. That's a war crime in itself. You have to report those sorts of things. And it goes on and on. 17% agreed or strongly agreed that all non-combatants should be treated as insurgents. Some said 17%, that's a relatively small amount. Well, that's not a relatively small amount when you consider the numbers of war fighters that are in the uh, domain uh, in these cases. And it goes on and on. They don't know how to respond. Uh, they uh, engage in mistreatment when they're angry uh, and so on. It's a very interesting uh, study. Uh, the only nation that has ever done this, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, I think it's something that should be done on a routine basis uh, for returning war fighters uh, henceforward. There was a sociological, inf uh, loosely described study uh, in Vietnam, which said that 100% of all fighters engaged in heavy combat, 33% of those engaged in medium level combat, and I believe it was either 9 or 17% of those engaged in light combat, aided, uh, witnessed, uh, or committed uh, an atrocity. Uh, that's, that, that's just unacceptable. I'm just sorry, that is completely and utterly unacceptable. And I'm not blaming the war fighters. These are human beings that are thrown into situations where no human being has ever been uh, designed to function in. It's horrific. Um, we uh, give them a rule book and say, you shouldn't do this. And then we have explosions and bullets and the tempo of the battlefield. It's not the Napoleonic era. We don't march up and look at each other and then fire a, a musket uh, across the field. Uh, right now, you're killing each other from greater distances uh, quite often. And the speed of this decision making is such that expecting careful deliberation before each action starts to become unreasonable. The nature of warfare is changing due to technology. And it's not just robotics that's causing it. The speed and delivery of effects uh, is a, a result for this. And there's many reasons why people fail. This is just a list of some from some of the studies uh, that I, I looked at. Dehumanization emotional tendencies, the seeking of revenge, anger and fear, um, and power uh, and pleasure from killing in a, in a rare few, but some uh, that will choose to do this. Uh, it's a failing in humanity. We are failing human beings. We are not perfect. We fail. The robots will fail too, but can they fail less? That's the real question. Can they fail less with respect to that? And so I really argue that we need to find a way to do this and through technology. And if you can't do it the way I suggest, OK, or don't want to do it the way I suggest, please tell me a way that we can. I would like to see non-combatant casualties significantly reduced. They won't be eliminated, but it's significantly over-reduced what we can. And I believe that we can do that through military things. Now, uh, Human Rights Watch has argued that we should ban these particular systems, period, uh, for a variety of different reasons. And I'm not going to go through all of those right now. If you like in questions afterwards, we can do that. But they have already argued that if you have in your armamentarium the uh, uh, capability to use precision-guided munitions, smart bombs, laser-guided bombs, you have a moral imperative to use those in an urban setting. Why? Because it will reduce uh, civilian casualties as opposed to dumb bombs, which you saw in Aleppo and other places as well, too, the effects of uh, dumb bombs as compared to smart bombs. Uh, but even then, mistakes are made landing in hospitals and other things uh, as well. Um, there was a, they argue there's a moral imperative. To me, these intelligent robotic systems, these aren't terminators. These aren't moral agents. They are not uh, responsible for their actions in any way, shape, or form. The human beings that put them there are responsible uh, for their actions. But they're a next generation, if you will, of precision-guided munitions. And potentially, they can do better. That is the argument uh, that I uh, make with this. Of course, you want, in certain cases, to allow human overrides, which I actually put in with some reservation the design of the system, because humans don't always override in the right way. Uh, if the system says, don't shoot, and we're giving the right for the system to refuse in order to shoot as well, too. A human may say, shoot. 
Um, but we want to add friction into that decision-making process, make it a little harder for someone to override that, and also annotate it and tell people when it occurs, which may do that. And they will also use different tasks, tactics, which means they will assume far more risk on behalf of a non-combatant than any human soldier in their right mind possibly would. These are machines. We can risk them. They can be put at risk. They can ferret out whether that's truly a combatant or a non-combatant, or at least have a higher probability of understanding it than uh, otherwise. So the research thesis I did in my work for the US Army uh, in 2006 to 2009 on this as well too, was basically can robots be more humane or can they have better legal and ethical compliance with international humanitarian law than human beings? This is a utilitarian argument. In other words, can we save lives? Can we save lives uh, using this particular technology over using a pure uh, human warfighting force? Notice again, I state that these systems are not going to be perfect. They will kill civilians. They will. There's no doubt about it. The question is, will they kill significantly less? And under those circumstances, as being a consequentialist that I am, I would argue that this right to life, which is a deontological argument, may trump some of the others as a right to a dignified death or other things that you hear uh, argued from the uh, NGOs. So the goal was to prov provide the robot the ability to refuse an unethical order. It's not just to go out and figure out who to kill, it's to figure out who not to kill uh, under these cases. To be able to report the behavior of human warfighters in this. this is not, these will work alongside with humans. They are not intended to replace entire forces and have robotic armies sweeping across the countryside, as we love to see in our Terminator sequels, uh, uh, one after the other. But no military is really thinking of doing that. And it's really important to maintain a human presence in the battlefield so that we get a deep understanding of the actual horrors of war uh, that do exist. And incorporate, as appropriate, the uh, Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions, uh, and the rules of engagement. Not all of them. There's something referred to as bounded morality. You use this in the context of where the system is operating in certain narrow missions. So you don't have to give it entire knowledge and entire reason, reasoning capabilities of a human being. That's not going to happen anytime soon. I don't believe the singularity is going to happen anytime soon as well, too. Um, but you have to be careful uh, in terms of recognizing the fact that these may do better in certain narrow situations, such as a building clearing operation, which is very dangerous to humans and where people often go astray, or counter sniper operations or things uh, of that sort. So when I first started this work, The Economist wrote a really nice article, but they had this kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, description, this picture over here, which I think captured kind of what I was trying to do, is how do we put something into these system uh, to make sure that uh, we can better protect uh, non-combatants than would be otherwise. And as you may know, AI of late seems to be making accelerated progress in a variety of different domains. Um, AlphaGo, which is the most recent one, where we finally beat what's considered by many to be the hardest uh, board game uh, of all, uh, has uh, the Google's AlphaGo has won uh, that particular case. And, Check, box. <laughs> Check over the box, humans, we can't do that, or machines can't do that anymore, has been thrown down to the floor. Uh, Kurzweil has a wonderful cartoon uh, illustrating some of those things as well, too. Uh, and you've seen autonomous cars. They're coming. Now we're worried about the legal and ethical ramifications. We were worried well, just a few years ago, could we even get an autonomous car to actually function uh, on the roads? And now they're predicting, in some cases, and there's taxis, Singapore and Pittsburgh and other places as well, too. Uh, you can get an Uber taxi and, uh, that has uh, complete self-driving capabilities. They don't always warn you, evidently. I spoke to someone who got that. The, the driver was just not, they put a human still in the car, but the driver was just not holding the wheel, right? close to holding the wheel uh, over that. Said, Why aren't you holding the wheel? It's a self-driving taxi uh, uh, in this case. And you're going to see more and more. Just heard about potential autonomous buses from airports uh, and the like. There are many interesting legal and ethical questions associated with that, which speak to both the trolley problem, to whether these systems should comply with the law. Uh, in other words, should they be allowed to speed? Or should they be allowed to comply with social norms as opposed to the law? These are design questions. How do you make those? Uh, how do you come up with the answers for those sorts of things? So for those of you in law, there's all kinds of fascinating things coming downstream. It's not just all uh, uh, the so-called killer robots. But where I argue that these systems do have a potential use is starting close in the middle there, is in high intensity interstate warfare, not in places where uh, there will be a preponderance of civilians or for policing type operations. It's 
not a pleasant thought to think about what kind of wars we might be engaged with in the future. But you can imagine uh, interstate actors if things go south and with our new president, I don't know what's going to happen uh, in, in certain circumstances, in certain relations. Um, but uh, we, we need to be prepared. Um, Counterinsurgency operations uh, quite often have a high preponderance of civilians. Although I did have a JAG lawyer in the field in Afghanistan, a high level one, argue that there are certain circumstances where it does have a place. I can talk about that in questions if we uh, get to that soon. Okay, I guess we're there. And again, alongside soldiers. There are many reasons why I believe it would work. Uh, the ability to act conservatively, again, assuming more risk. We will have sensors that can see far better than human beings under these kinds of circumstances. Um, leave out emotions and a variety of other things as well, too. And uh, objectively uh, uh, reporting uh, misbehavior, if you will, by other parties. There are many, many arguments against this as well, too. Uh, and the list is kind of stabilized. Uh, uh, in terms of the arguments I've uh, heard, uh, the establishment of responsibility, the use ad bellum arguments in terms of will this make us more likely to go off to war uh, as any asymmetric advantage in military technology would. There are many other things as well too. The military is not too happy with a sorry Dave, I can't do that uh, kind of attitude uh, in a robotic system. And the list goes on and on. Uh, we can talk about those if you like, and I believe there are good answers for each and every one of those. But we need to represent are the hallmark characteristics of uh, the uh, just war theory, which are enshrined in international humanitarian law, the principles of military necessity, unnecessary suffering, proportionality, and discrimination or distinction. This is the hardest, and that's why I argue again for uh, bounded morality, hardest in my mind. Some argue that proportionality is, but I disagree. If you saw the movie Eye in the Sky with Helen Mirren or not, uh, that really shows an interesting proportionality co computation uh, going on in real time, which was used uh, for the engagement of targets. And there are software systems kind of like that. Codified laws of war. I have to go a little bit fast because I'm, I'm running long. There are approaches. I'm not going to talk about the technical approaches, but there's a version of action-based machine ethics, which is based on deontic logic uh, that uses the logic of obligations, prohibitions, uh, and permissions. Uh, for most of the stuff that we have here, it's fairly straightforward. We have built, in, in my book and papers, you can read uh, about the different kinds of ways in which we implemented this from a mathematical theory, which drew from the original behavior-based robotics book, uh, extended into four different components, including an ethical governor and an ethical adapter, uh, and showed the high-level flow of control, but implemented uh, in simulation. We instituted, as I mentioned, overrides, both uh, negative overrides, uh, which is the basic big red button that you like on any uh, robot, don't do that, stop, uh, that an operator could have. Uh, the other one is a little more difficult uh, where you're refusing an order and the guy says, I have better intelligence than you, you should engage that particular target. Like I said, we want to make sure that that's done carefully and not uh, uh, in, uh, without caution. Some example scenarios, I'll present a couple here. Uh, this is one. We have a story tonight that has to do with a single photograph. It's a surveillance photo taken in Afghanistan and obtained exclusively by NBC News. It's a photo of a gathering of Taliban fighters, but some say it shows more than that. Some say it shows what was a perfect opportunity to take out the enemy, but the military was unable to take the shot. The question is why? It was NBC News correspondent Kerry Sanders who obtained this photo exclusively. He reports for us tonight from Kabul. Brian, it took five days for the U.S. military to consider my request to declassify the photograph. It's a grainy still image that shows what some here in Afghanistan say was a lost opportunity to inflict serious damage on the Taliban. Army intelligence officers say the photo shows 190 members of the Taliban at a funeral two months ago. The U.S. Army claims among those in the formation, high-ranking members of the Taliban leadership. An unmanned armed predator like this one was spying on the group. Intelligence officers monitoring the scene in real time wanted to fire. They asked permission. The request went to intelligence analysts, senior commanders, and lawyers. The intelligence officers were told, no, they were not allowed to fire. Why? U.S. rules of engagement do not permit waging war in a cemetery. That was frustrating. Those individuals live to fight another day and potentially uh, could uh, cause harm to our soldiers, uh, uh, civilians, uh, the population of uh, government Afghanistan. 
Despite frustration, U.S. military leaders here say the decision not to fire was the right one. Meantime, the Taliban fight by their own rules on Monday at a funeral for an Afghan government. Now, whether you agree or disagree with that choice that was specified in the rules of engagement, and I don't even know if those were the actual rules of engagement. Keep in mind, rules of engagement are classified because you don't want your enemy to know how you're going to fight. But juxtapose that to being same individuals on top of a hospital, on the roof of a hospital, or worshiping in a mosque. And you knew that they were that. Those are protected structures under international humanitarian law. We can build systems right now that will refuse to fire on that. That's just GPS coordinates. It's as simple as that. If you have a school, or if you have a mosque, or if you have protected property. And if someone tries to pull the trigger on that, it just won't go. We don't do that. We do not build that extra level of protection into these kinds of systems. This is the ability to refuse to fire under certain circumstances. And also, if they're outside so-called kill zones, which are specified uh, by uh, uh, rules of engagement, you can also refuse to fire under those circumstances. This, to me, would reduce the likelihood of violations of international humanitarian law. And another example, which I don't show this video because it's rather gruesome, uh, is of a Apache helicopter uh, which was standing off over uh, three uh, insurgents, uh, we believe, but certainly fit the description, and I believe uh, qualified as hostile or hostile intent. Uh, we're planting roadside bombs from a truck, uh, improvised explosive devices uh, alongside the road. Uh, an Apache helicopter from a distance is rather quiet. You can't really hear it. So it goes up, um, and uh, it has a, what's called a chain gun. Uh, it fires mini cannon shells, uh, like a Gatling gun, but it's very, I'm sorry? 50 cal. 50 cal, yeah. It's, uh, it's, and they, they explode uh, on contact. Uh, they uh, rather are not a, very pleasant to look at in its effects on a human body. So that's one of the reasons why I don't uh, show those. It's, it's kind of almost a liquefaction. Uh, but in my discussions with the military, this is described as neutral, neutralizing the enemy. And that's it's a neutralization process. That's typically how it's uh, uh, referred to. In this particular instance, which when I ask my military colleagues who've seen this video, I say, how many have seen it? About three quarters uh, have uh, seen this video uh, in the room, at least in the United States. Uh, they've seen that. It's actually a, what's called war porn or a brag video. They even actually put their names and titles at the back uh, of it as well, too, which is sent back uh, from the battlefield. And uh, the thing that happened here is the first person is targeted. He is uh, neutralized. Uh, and. Uh, the second individual, uh, this is by a chain, uh, the chain gunner uh, in this particular case, um, he uh, is uh, looking at um, uh, what happened and kind of is frozen like a deer in the headlights. The gunner retargets and engages that individual, um, and that individual is neutralized. By then, the third person kind of figured something bad going on here and ducks under the truck at this point in time. The gunner then uh, fires to the right side of the truck. Remember, exploding shells and the like. And then this dialogue occurs after that. Um, um, the first truck was destroyed. And want me to take the other truck out? And then the, I don't know, it depends on this whether the commander was directly in the, uh, the pilot uh, was giving the commands or whether it was someone remote. I don't know uh, that. But the voice is, uh, Roger, wait for move by the truck. They see this individual come, get out of the truck, move about five meters, and collapse. Uh, on the side uh, as well. It, voice one says, movement right there. Roger, he's wounded. When he says he's wounded, he's no longer posing a threat. In international humanitarian law, he's declared hors de combat and has achieved status of a non-combatant at that point in time, according to law. Um, and, the and under international humanitarian law, even if that person could be rescued by opposing forces, you can't kill him. You can't do a summary execution in this particular case. But what happens next is, uh, oh, there's a uh, voice two says, without any hesitation, hit him. The uh, gunner continues to target the truck at that point in time. The other voice says, hit the truck and him. Go forward of it and hit him. The gunner then uh, moves the gun, the crosshairs to the wounded man, discharges the weapon, and uh, that individual has been neutralized. Um, I've asked, I've presented this many times to military JAG lawyers, and you're law students, many of you, right, uh, as well, too. And the question is, I ask them, is, should my robot take that shot? What should the robot do under those circumstances? 
I'm not asking, did that guy commit a war crime, which is a different question. I'm asking, would you want my robot to take that shot? And 99 out of 100, and I think that's exactly, close to the exact right number, have all said no. One guy, who was actually very high up in the chain, said, yes, I, Chatham House rules, I can't say more uh, uh, than that. But, um, so there's a divergence of opinion as well, too, as to what the right action would be. But uh, put this on the other side. Suppose you were on the ground there, okay? And you, this commander was telling this uh, a GI to walk over there with a pistol and blow his brains out. Now granted, that individual may die. He may be mortally wounded, and he probably was mortally wounded. And I suppose you could justify it under, we're just, you know, a coup de grace and, and the like. But IHL doesn't allow for that. You're supposed to send help. That's as I, my readings of IHL, but I have to preface all this, as I always do, with the acronym IANAL. I am not a lawyer, so I don't have the, uh, uh, the answers uh, for that. So that's why I'm not ready to uh, comment on whether these are war crimes or not. The question is, what should the robot do? After being declared, and parsed out, he's wounded. Okay, other examples where lethal force may be allowable. DMZ, uh, uh, there is an active state of war. Well, it's not active, it's uh, an armistice right now, but there is a state of war that exists between North and South Korea in the demilitarized zone. There is a line there that is called the military Demar demarcation line, the MDL, which if you choose to cross, can be shot. It's as simple as that. Um, sometime uh, civilians have crossed that in the past. In other cases, recently, uh, South Korean soldiers were wounded by mines that are present. There's some of the place where we have active minefields still. And the U.S. has minefields uh, there uh, as well. Basically, with the goal of slowing down a large enemy force sweeping through the area. That's one of the things that the landmines do. And one of the things that you do when you have a landmine field is you want to provide crossfire across that minefield to slow down the penetration of that minefield. And if you just have minutes, if you can gain minutes, that may be enough to rally a response in this uh, particular day and age. So the use of this technology to potentially kill, and actually, I don't know if you saw it, but it actually can find people uh, five kilometers away in uh, uh, daylight and three kilometers at night and put a bead right on the target of one of the individuals that were there as well too. And this is an old version, they have new versions. These have been deployed, and it has in the past, if they don't like to talk about it anymore, an auto mode operation. Samsung sold off the company. Uh, it's no longer called uh, a Samsung because they didn't want to be, have this associated with their TVs and uh, exploding washing machines. Do you have exploding washing machines like we have in the US too? Uh, and their iPhones. I, actually, everything seems to be lethal now with Samsung, right? So <laughs> washing machines and iPhones and everything else. So but that's another story. Uh, okay, so. Uh, another case we'd like to test this, we have facilities uh, not far from Georgia Tech uh, where uh, we have run experiments in the past. Uh, it's a Cold War type village uh, where you have an urban setting and you can run scenarios with robotic systems and force on force operations using real experimental soldiers. They're not experimental soldiers, they're experimental force. And they use experiments and new technology and you can equip them with these sorts of things and get an understanding of, can we actually evaluate these things accordingly? Now this is a part of the simulation that we had. I don't know if this will start by itself or not. It's not. This, I gave a talk at uh, the World Science Fair in Brisbane last year. I guess it was this year, January. Um, and they did a real nice job in doctoring up our simulation. So I like to show this one more than the raw simulation, which is a little less interesting. But it shows the kind of reasoning that our underlying software uh, was, is capable of doing. Where again, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a predator, uh, in this case, uh, looking in a particular area, looking for uh, certain tanks, uh, for example. And there's different classes of that, uh, a T-80 tank. Uh, we're friends with Russia now, so it's not likely to happen, right? We're uh, all buddies uh, with our new president. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it's, that's at least what Trump seems to think about Putin. Uh, and uh, I know the Polish aren't too happy about that. Um, but we have these capabilities, and you could do assessment of structural damage. That's very reminiscent of what you might have seen in terms of uh, uh, the eye in the sky. And 
what's called CD fast, collateral damage fast, which used to be called bug splat, which is probably the worst possible name for a collateral damage uh, assessment program uh, that you could have. And it would make decisions as to whether to engage or whether uh, to not engage, uh, and so on. Uh, these are the sorts of things uh, that our system did in the context of these kinds of scenarios. There are many other videos available on our website to be able to see that. But I want to just leave you with the notion that this is far from a solved problem. This is not something, except in very rare instances, that can be put out into the battlefield in broad space anytime uh, soon. There are many questions, such as developing the right tactics to recognize those that are hors de combat, uh, to be able to do fully automated combat, non-combatant discrimination in very narrow sets of circumstances, to do proportionality optimization uh, in the field, assessment of military necessity, practical planning. This one's really hard. How do we tell? How do we tell if we achieve those particular goals? Uh, the benchmarks, metrics, and evaluations. And also conceivably use ethical advisory systems for warfighters to make them think twice, perhaps, which is actually very dangerous to a warfighter uh, because if you make them think twice in the wrong circumstances, they may be killed. So uh, there's arguments that warfighters have used to say that we should either leave us alone or uh, automate the process uh, entirely. Other countries have considered the use of ethical algorithms, uh, Israel in particular. Um, and the point is, when people start doing this, just like rules of engagement, uh, it will go black. Uh, we won't hear about it. Uh, so uh, we won't have all the answers for these sorts of things. And of course, if you just hate the thought of robots killing people, uh, there's something that's been incorporated from the beginning of international humanitarian law called the Martin's Clause which states that weapons which violate the dictates of the public conscience may also be prohibited on that basis alone. But no one really knows how we show that it violates the dictates of the public conscience, as they state uh, as well, too. And there's no accepted interpretation to date. But there are those in the uh, uh, NGOs that are pursuing this particular path as well, too. It sounds pretty bad to have a bunch of robot killers, killer robots out there. Uh, is that enough uh, to uh, allow for the banning of these sorts of things? So the Martin's Clause has been there uh, since the very beginning uh, of IHL. So summarizing again, whatever you think about the approach, the status quo is utterly and completely unacceptable with respect to non-combatant casualties. And we need to do something uh, about that. Uh, existing IHL may be adequate. Uh, IHL is pretty darn good. I won't say it's like the Constitution of the United States and that hard to amend. And there certainly should be things, I believe, in regulating this, these systems as they go out into the battle space. They should not be let loose in every way imaginable. And that's why I support a moratorium uh, with uh, respect to that. We've done some work in this particular space. I make no claim that that's the best way to do it. It's a proof of concept idea. Uh, and there may be many other ways uh, approaching that. There are many others as well, too, uh, working on these particular problems, including a gentleman uh, sitting in the front row uh, over there from New Zealand. Um, if you want any additional information, this book is the most comprehensive version of that, but there's also a lot of free versions of papers on my uh, uh, website, which uh, you can get almost all the information from that as well, too. Um, I'm actively involved in many of the IEEE efforts uh, as well, too, uh, and I encourage you to be as well. So with that, I will be glad to open it up for questions. Thank you very much.